everyone, my name is Haley Elizabeth, and if you don't know who I am, this is my true crime podcast called Behind You, where once a week I sit down and I talk about a true crime case, all things true crime, from murder, disappearances, cult, to the biggest drug bust in history, the biggest bank heist in history, all things true crime. So if you're interested in any of that, you can subscribe on the YouTube channel and watch the visual version every Wednesday, or you can head on over to Spotify, Apple, or wherever you can find podcasts and listen to the audio version every Tuesday. And if not, totally fine. Like no pressure, no pressure. We are just here to talk some true crime, relax, like no hard feelings. If you just want to listen to this one and go, I'm just happy to have you here. Today, we are going to be talking about the case of Tim McLean. This case has been highly, highly requested, and there is a lot to get through, so let's just hop right into it. Tim McLean was born on October 3rd, 1985 in Ely, Manitoba, Canada. It's a very small town. He grew up with his mom, Carol, his father, Tim, and his little brother, Kendall. As a kid, he was described as very outgoing. He was not shy at all, and he was loved by everyone. His favorite thing to do was meet new people. He was the type of person that could, like, walk into a room where he knew no one and just automatically, like, leave with best friends. His brother described him as, quote, extremely charismatic, often demanded the attention of a room with his presence and strong magnetic personality. He was a very spontaneous person. He was the type of person that was kind of down to do a little bit of everything. He loved, loved, loved trying new things and seeing new things. As a teenager, he was really, really good in school, and one of his favorite things to do was to go to the gym and work out, but one of the things that he did not like to do too much was actual working. He typically couldn't really hold a job for too long, and he would most likely get, you know, bored or just quit altogether if he, you know, if he entered a job and he made as many friends as he could at that job, he just got bored and even, like, quit a lot of the time, so he would just move on to the next job. But although he would jump around a lot from thing to thing, he was never concerned about anything. He was never concerned about if he was going to make enough money or if he was, you know, going to be nice to the wrong person. He was never really concerned about any of that. He was literally just living his life. And this carried with him all throughout his teenage years and well after high school into his adult years. He just, you know, as I said, loved to just meet new people and do new things. And then in the summer, of 2008 at 22 years old uh tim's childhood friend had actually reached out to tim and said hey i have a job opportunity for you if you are interested in doing so and basically it was a job to be a carnival worker and tim being tim of course hopped on the opportunity because as i said this was the perfect job for him carnivals tended to travel a lot they go from city to city every week so this was the perfect thing for Tim to do. He was able to meet new people and constantly go to new places. So him and his childhood friend packed their bags and they stayed at the carnival for what was supposed to be a week. It was just supposed to be like a trial period to see if this was something that he really, really wanted to do. And him and his best friend ended up loving this job. And so they not only stayed just one week, but they decided to take this on as a summer job. His brother Kendall would also say, quote, Tim loved the carnival so much. It, like him, was nomadic, loud, and wild with a constant cycle of new faces passing by. He was very much living the embodiment of it. It was also during this time where Tim had a girlfriend named Colleen, and Colleen was actually pregnant at this time. Uh, Colleen was pregnant with her third child. This was her very first child with Tim, but she actually had two previous children from a previous marriage. So with, you know, Tim having a pregnant girlfriend at home, he didn't want to stay far away from her for too long. And for the summer, they were traveling all over the place. And then towards the end of the summer is when they started to make their last few stops. One of their last few locations was a place in Canada called Edmonton. So they were going from Edmonton to Regina. And so Tim, as I said, since he wanted to spend more time with Colleen, he, instead of going to Regina with everyone else, he just 
just decided to take a bus back home to Winnipeg, which Winnipeg is like on the outskirts of Ellie, Manitoba. So if he went to Winnipeg, he could like easily go home. And he actually planned on going home so that he could set up arrangements to move to British Columbia with Colleen. British Columbia was one of the places that they visited on the carnival route and he just fell in love with it and he felt, you know, this is the place that I want to, you know, grow old in. This is the place that I want to raise my child in. So he was going to go back home and make arrangements to move to British Columbia. Now from Edmonton to Winnipeg, it's a long time. For a bus, it's about 24 hours, a super long time. And so because of this, a lot of Tim's co-workers offered to buy him a plane ticket because that would be so much easier. But Tim was like, no, it's fine. Like, I'll just take the bus. It's whatever. And of course, as I said, Tim loved meeting new people. So if he's on a bus, you know, people constantly coming in and out, that is his element, basically. Just after midnight on July 29th, that is when Tim got onto the Greyhound bus to go from Edmonton to Winnipeg. And along with Tim on this bus was also a man by the name of Vince Lee. A little bit of backstory on Vince Lee. Vince Lee was born on April 30th, 1968 in China. And there is little information to be found about his childhood, except he went to the Wuhan Institute of Technology in 19. 1992, and it was there where he got his bachelor's in computer science. He worked in Beijing as a computer software engineer from the years of 1994 to 1998, and then he immigrated to Canada in 2001. He lived in Winnipeg, Canada, and it was here where he also worked at a church. He also had a wife at the time, Anna, so it was very important for him to have a job so he could support her. Vince's boss at this church would go on to say that Vince was a very hardworking person. He was very determined, but he would get frustrated quite easily because of the language barrier. Um, Vince mostly spoke Mandarin and the little English that he did know, he just wasn't able to speak it very clearly. And so this kind of created a language barrier between him and everyone else around him. You know, it was very frustrating for him to to try to get his point across when he didn't know how to get his point across. So then in 2006, that is when he left the church and him and Anna decided to move to Edmonton where he worked very odd jobs as such as he worked in fast food, he was a delivery boy, he worked for a newspaper. And over time, he not only got more frustrated because of the language barrier, he also got more frustrated because, as I said, he had a bachelor's in computer science. And back home in Beijing, he was a computer software engineer. So he was really using something with his degree. But in Canada, he was unfortunately not able to find anything that, you know, was something to do with his degree. And because of this, his mental state started to go downhill as well in that in late of 2006, he was actually institutionalized and put into a mental hospital after um, like police officers had found him wandering the streets. And when, you know, the police officers asked what he was doing, Vince replied that he was following the sun because it's what God told him to do. So when he was uh, placed in to the mental hospital. He was then diagnosed with schizophrenia. He was supposed to take medication for his schizophrenia, but he ended up never doing that. He did in the beginning, but he just felt like he didn't need them, and so this schizophrenia would soon just go untreated. And because of this, his mental state just started to decline even more to the point where he just randomly left his wife to another place in Edmonton, and then when his wife was like, what are you doing? His wife later joined him that first time that he left but there was a second time that he again abruptly left his wife but this second time around he had actually left a note that said quote I'm gone don't look for me I wish you were happy 
Anna would later on say that she has no clue why he would say something like that. Like, they never got into specific arguments about how she wasn't happy. She really cared for Vince and she wanted to see him get better and have his, you know, mental state get better. But all the things that he was doing, it just made no sense and it was honestly very tiring for Anna. So, in the years of 2007 to 2008, Vince just continued to work very odd jobs and and whilst he was working these odd jobs, his mental health was just slowly declining more and more. And the more his mental health started to decline, his temper also started to shorten as well. In June of 2008, Vince was actually working at Walmart, but was fired due to a disagreement with the other employees. So then July 28th of 2008, that is when Vince actually had a job as a delivery boy and he asked his job if he could have a weekend off because he was going to go to a job interview that was in Winnipeg. So then on July 28th, that is when Vince got on the Greyhound bus to go off to Winnipeg. That night on July 28th at 6 p.m., that's when he got off of the bus in Erickson, Manitoba, and it was here that he slept on a nearby bench near the bus stop because this was the type of bus stop that only had one bus a day. So he was just sitting there. Witnesses say that he had three suitcases and he was selling things out of his suitcases, such as his computers and his personal belongings, just because he needed some extra cash. So he just slept on this bench until the next bus came. There was also some witnesses saying that they saw him around like 3 a.m. or in the middle of the night where there would be times where he would just sit up straight on the bench and just keep his eye super wide open and looking around. And then at 6.55 p.m. the next day on July 29th, that is when the Greyhound bus came to the bus stop. Vince got on and this was the same bus that Tim McLean was on. Witnesses on the bus say that Vince looked to be around mid 40s, shaved head, wearing sunglasses. He was pretty tall. Um, and a lot of people say that he was just kind of minding his own business. Like he didn't look suspicious, but he also didn't look happy to be there. He was just, you know, going home just like everyone else. So in the beginning of the bus ride, um, Tim was actually sitting in the way, way back of the bus, like the last row by the window. As for Vince, Vince sat towards the front during the beginning of the bus ride. So a while goes by and the bus pulls over so that they could take a rest stop because as I said, this was a 24 hour bus ride. So a lot of people, you know, needed time to grab some things from the vending machine. They needed something to drink or just stretch their legs. So Tim actually took this time to get off of the bus and have a cigarette. It was also said that at during this time as well, um, Vince also went out to have a cigarette with a specific woman um but no one really knows like who the woman was or anything but he just went out so once their time was up tim went back on the bus and went right to exactly where he was before but as for vince vince didn't go to his seat in the front he actually went all the way to the back and sat right next to tim so Tim was in the window seat and Vince was in the aisle seat. And as I said, Tim like loved meeting new people. So the fact that Vince had sat next to him, Tim was very excited. He was like, oh my God, like all these spaces in the bus and this man decided to sit next to me. Like, let's spark up a conversation. I want to get to know him. So he just looked to Vince and said, hey, how are you? But to this, Vince didn't say anything back back and so Tim was just assuming like oh he probably doesn't want to talk he's probably tired that's completely fine so Tim just puts back on his headphones he leans his head against the window and goes to sleep and around this time as well, everybody on the bus was either sleeping, reading, eating, you know, watching movies. Everybody was, there was no like chaos really going on the bus. Everybody was just, you know, in their own little worlds. So a while goes on around 8.30 p.m., a witness that was sitting in front of Vince and Tim say that he's just sitting there, he's reading, and then all of a sudden he hears a blood curdling scream coming from the back of him. And when he turns around he sees Vince 
has a knife in his hand and he's just stabbing Tim. Once the man sees this, he screams, he freaks out. So this specific passenger's stress kind of, you know, lingered onto everyone else where everybody was screaming, it was chaos, everybody was trying to like trample and push each other to get off of the bus. And all whilst this is going on, Vince is still stabbing Tim. He's stabbing Tim in the neck and the chest area specifically. And a lot of passengers say that Tim during this moment was trying to fight back. Back, but it was really hard to fight back because as I said Tim was in the way back of the bus and he was also in the window seat so there was nowhere for him to go he was completely cornered he would have to like gather some strength to jump over the seat in front of him he couldn't go behind him because it was just the back of the bus so there was really nothing he could do but he really was trying his hardest to fight back and during this struggle uh tim falls onto the floor and that is when vince continues to stab tim the bus driver can see everything that's going on due to his rear view mirror so he sees what's going on he's trying to yell at like vince uh to stop stabbing tim but the bus eventually just pulls over and he lets all the passengers out and the passengers are all in different stages uh witnesses say that some of the passengers went out and started puking others were crying others were in shock others were just screaming and running anywhere to get help and the bus driver was named bruce so bruce got all of the passengers off of the bus but he did not get off the bus himself he thought that maybe there was a way that he could still save tim so bruce walks over to Vince who is now stabbing Tim and he tries to reason with Vince he's trying to get him to stop and this angers Vince so he sees Vince turn around and start walking towards Bruce with a knife so as Bruce like runs away he shuts the door and when he locks the door Vince actually is able to get the hand that he has his knife in out of the window so he kind of swipes at the people on the outside outside of the door but once it locks he puts his uh, arm back in the bus and with that it was um bruce and another passenger who were trying to barricade the door to make sure vince didn't get out and it was at this moment where everyone also started to call the police during this a truck driver driving past sees all of the commotion they see the crying passengers this truck driver sees two people trying trying to keep the door closed so this truck pulls over and he gets out his name was actually Chris uh, Chris gets out of his truck and he's trying to figure out what's going on and as he's approaching the bus all of the passengers start screaming he has a knife he has a knife so um, he actually gets a crowbar from his truck and comes back and tries to help um, the bus driver and the passenger barricade the door and the reason why they're barricading the door is because Vince is trying his hardest to get out of the bus he's stabbing and punching at the door he's stabbing all of the windows trying to get out but for some reason he just can't and so when he kind of gives up on the idea that he won't be able to escape he just goes back to tim and continue to stab him and as I said, like this is a Greyhound bus. And if you're unfamiliar with Greyhound buses, Greyhound buses have very tall and large windows. So while all of this is going on, everyone can see everything Vince is doing. So whilst Chris, Bruce, and this passenger are trying to help barricade the door and make sure Vince doesn't get out, um, there is another Greyhound bus that sees what's going on. So he also pulls over and and this guy's name is Bernie. So Bernie pulls over. When he sees what's going on, Bernie is like, okay, there may be like some sort of possibility that Tim is still alive like what if he's still alive in there and we could still save him so Bernie volunteers to go inside of the bus and see if Tim is still alive 
So he gets into the bus and Vince is continuing to stab Tim and doesn't even really realize that Bernie is there. And it wasn't until Bernie started talking to Vince, he was trying to reason with him, trying to get him to stop. And that's when Vince turns around. And so Bernie is able to get a clear view of uh, Tim's body. And that's when he realizes that Vince was not stabbing Tim, he was actually beheading Tim. So Bernie, when he sees this, he's very, very shocked, but Vince starts walking towards him. So Bernie runs off of the bus, but again, Vince tries to chase after him, but is unsuccessful. And so Bernie, Chris, Bruce, and the passenger, all four of these guys are now trying to barricade the door, but they see Vince go from the door and back to Tim, so they all peek inside of the bus to see what Vince is doing, and that is when a witness, the passenger in this situation, he says that when they all looked into the bus to see what Vince was doing, they saw Vince pick up Tim's head and stare at them with Tim's head in his hands and then just drop Tim's head on the floor. So all of the passengers, you know, everybody who's watching all of this go down and even the four guys that were helping out to barricade the door and was looking inside of the bus, everyone saw this. Everyone saw Tim's head and it was a very obviously a very traumatic experience for everyone and even the witness the passenger that was helping out in this situation he said that you know he he can't even begin to process how he's going to heal from seeing something as gruesome as that and even after that Vince continued to take it a step further and not just you know show everyone Tim's head he took it a step further and as he was stabbing Tim he started to take out Tim's organs and pieces of his flesh and eat it in front of everyone and Although all of this is going on, everyone is just in complete shock at what they're seeing. It's the type of thing where like you want to look away, but at the same time, you're just so you're just like so frozen in fear that you can't look away. And although Bernie had seen the worst of the worst, same with everything else, Bernie is still somehow able to be logical and rational in what they need to do next until the police get there. So Bernie suggests that they cut the power off on the bus to prevent um, Vince from trying to, you know, get in the driver's seat and drive off so this ended up working uh bruce went to the you know the system of the bus and turned it off completely so then at one point vince actually did try to turn on the bus and leave but the bus didn't turn on because they had disconnected everything and so once vince realized that there was really no way out like he couldn't go through the door he couldn't go through the windows he couldn't drive off he just thought nothing else to do than just continue to stab tim So at 9 p.m., a whole 30 minutes after the incident had started, that's when the police finally show up. A officer by the name of Corporal Harder tried to actually talk to Vince and ask him to drop the knife out of a small open window that was on the bus. And Vince's responses are very, like you can't really make them out. They're kind of just muffled, except they could make this one thing out that Vince said. And he said, quote, I'm going to stay on this bus forever. And all while the police are trying to reason with Vince to drop his weapon and get out of the bus he continues to cut parts of Tim's body off and then he displays it in front of everyone before smelling it and then eating it kind of like he was putting on a show for everyone and this part you know 
it makes a lot of people think that since he was sort of doing things in this manner, like he knew people were watching, he also was licking the blood off of his fingers and hands as well. It kind of makes people think that Tim in this moment knew what he was doing was wrong. Like he wasn't doing it because he had like a voice in his head or something that told him to do it. Like you could kind of tell that Vince knew what he was doing and that's why he was like putting on a performance sort of for everyone. There was at one point as well where um, Vince was carrying Tim's organs just back and forth across the bus. He was also taking white uh, trash bags and putting Tim's organs in there as well. And then between 9 30 to 10 p.m. that is when help arrived for the passengers. So the passengers were taken on a bus uh, to go away from the crime scene and taken to the Brandon RCMP Detachment Center, which is basically like It's similar to a police station, except it's not for local crimes. It's more for federal crimes because this was a very, very gruesome crime. And then after questioning, they were later sent to a hotel and that's where everybody stayed for the night. So that night, following into the early morning, July 31st at 1.20 a.m., that is when Vince broke one of the back windows and out of the window, he threw his knife, his scissors, some personal belongings, and himself as well. He jumped out the back window, but when he did, he landed head first on the top of his knife. And so since Vince was kind of in this like daze a little bit, the police took this opportunity to charge at him and try to put him in handcuffs. Vince was of course resisting arrest. He was struggling and screaming and he refused to surrender until the police officers had taken him several times and it was then where he kind of gave up and allowed the police officers to arrest him. He was taken to the Portage General Hospital for treatment on a gash on his right hand as well as a cut to his head behind his right ear. When he got to the hospital, he was searched and in his back pocket in a plastic baggie, that is when they found Tim's ear, nose, and tongue. The police were able to get into the bus once Vince was, you know, being transported to the hospital and the police say that when they went in there, it was the most gruesome scene they had ever seen. There was blood and organs everywhere. There was pieces of skin lying all over the floor. There was organs in trash bags or just laying on the seats. There was blood everywhere on the bus as well as unfortunately Tim's head because as I said, Vince had beheaded Tim's head. So all of the police officers and the medical examiners had to look at all of this and when they took Tim's body um, in for an autopsy to see you know what the damages were they found that part of Tim's heart as well as both of his eyes were gone and it is speculated that Vince had ate part of his heart as well as both of his eyes and that's why they were never recovered. Later on in the morning so as I said it's like around 1 20 a.m. when Vince is sent to the hospital. That same morning around 7 a.m., that's when all of the passengers left the hotel and the police officers led them to a nearby store so that all of them could get new clothes and like get out of the ones that they had because mostly all of their clothes had blood all over them. And um, as far as like everyone's luggage on the bus, a greyhound had actually compensated everyone for all of their belongings that had been like stained with blood or maybe the things that they left on the bus that they weren't able to retrieve. So once they were given new clothes, that is when they were put onto a new bus and going back home to Winnipeg. And I can't even like imagine what that 
bus ride back home was like for all of these people to experience something as traumatic as that on a bus and then get right back on a bus like I feel like that is just the most traumatic thing ever and I can't even begin to even like imagine what that would be like for them or what that was like for them So Vince was indeed arrested and on March 3rd of 2009, that is when Vince's trial began. Vince's defense team said that he was not guilty by reasons of insanity. Vince said that on the night of July 29th when he got on the bus, the voices in his head told him that he was in great danger and so when he got off of the bus to have a cigarette and he came back on, something just led him to sit next to Tim and so he said that Tim was really nice to him and Tim asked Vince how he was doing but Vince more saw this as a threat and he heard quote the voice of God telling him that if he does not stab Tim to death right now then he himself will die immediately so Vince claims that he listened to the voice in his head and just started to stab Tim the police Police also investigated if there was some sort of connection between Vince and Tim, maybe a premeditative motive, but there was nothing. These were two complete strangers. Vince also declined any allegations of him eating parts of Tim's body, which again really makes no sense when all of the witnesses say that they saw Vince eat parts of Tim. A lot of the witnesses also spoke up at Tim's trial and said that it was a very traumatizing experience for all of them. Uh, The passenger that was helping out the three bus drivers said that when Vince picked up Tim's decapitated head and held it in front of them, Vince had absolutely no emotion on his face. He just stared at them as if Vince was just showing Tim's head to them. He said that there was no emotion in his face, there was no life behind his eyes. So due to not only Vince's stories, but everyone else's stories as well, the court was able to come to a decision and the court believed more Vince's story because as I said, Vince had been diagnosed with schizophrenia a few years prior and so because of that, they believed that Vince genuinely heard voices in his head because his schizophrenia had gone untreated for so long. So after all of this and due to all of the stories heard, they found Vince Lee guilty but not criminally responsible due to reasons of insanity. The court said they came to this decision based upon his 2006 diagnosis of schizophrenia and it going untreated for all of these years because he did not want to take his meds. But they believe that if he were to be put back onto medication and given the right help, he could definitely turn his life around. So he was placed into a mental hospital instead of a prison and it was here he stayed for a whole seven years and then he was released back in 2015. When he was released in 2015, he was released first into a group home for about a year until February of 2016. He moved out independently and legally changed his name to Will Baker. So as of today, right now, as we're speaking, Vince, the person that I told you did all those horrendous, terrible things, beheaded an innocent man, gave such trauma to everyone every single person involved in this situation. He is out and about. He is working now. He's living his life. He's having friends. He's having experiences. He's seeing the world just like you and I and basically just living his life as if nothing ever happened. So because of this, it stirred up a lot of anger within everyone. Everyone was extremely angry that the police were not holding Vince accountable 
for any of his crimes. A lot of the passengers specifically found it very, very disrespectful. They thought that it wasn't fair that Vince was the one that was getting all of the help and the therapy and making sure that he's okay and he's on the right track. But what about all of the therapy and the help for all of the passengers? Vince was the catalyst. He was the reason why people had all of that trauma. He was the reason why Tim had died. So why is it fair that the murderer gets more help than the innocent passengers who did nothing but had to leave with so much hurt and trauma? And every single one of those passengers had encountered some sort of PTSD. Chris, the bus driver, actually came out afterwards and said that after this incident, he fell into heavy alcohol abuse because he just could not sleep at night. He, every time he closed his eyes, he had nightmares and he would just see Tim's head in Vince's hands. And every time he closed his eyes, he just thought of that image. So he fell into a very heavy alcohol abuse. So he abused alcohol very, very heavily. There was this other passenger who was pregnant at the time. So when she had her baby, she was unable to take care of her baby because she was just dealing with so much PTSD of the situation that she ended up actually having her baby taken away from her for a whole 18 months. So even just from those two stories alone, and I bet that every single passenger has a very similar story of how they have struggled mentally and, you know, socially ever since this happening. And again, it's just not fair that Vince gets all of these special privileges whilst the victims, the witnesses, have to live with it for the rest of their life and no help at all. They just saw it as very unfair that Vince was getting all the special treatment. He was going to therapies. He was getting medicated. He was being taken care of while all of these innocent victims, all of these innocent witnesses got absolutely nothing from it. All that, as I said, all they got was some compensation money from Greyhound for all of their items that were bloodstained. And that was it. Greyhound had never given them even resources to get some sort of therapy or something from this. And I am definitely, you know, for helping people. Like if you commit a crime, I feel like it's a lot more beneficial if you are being seen by a psychiatrist and getting, you know, professional medical help rather than just rotting in a prison cell. But I feel like in this situation, it is good that Vince is getting this medical help, but he should be getting this medical help in prison. He shouldn't be out and about. He should get himself, you know, back on track. He should make himself feel better, but in in prison, you know? And I don't, again, for that horrendous of a crime, seven years is not enough. Seven years is not enough at all. So as for the aftermath of all of this, Tim's mother, um, it was said that the next day after this Greyhound bus situation had happened, Tim's mother was watching the news that day and seeing what had happened, but they didn't see who the victim was or what their name was. So Tim's mother saw that and didn't know that it was Tim. So at lunch, they said a prayer for the victim that had died in the accident, unknowing that the person they saw that had just suffered that brutal, brutal crime was their son. And so afterwards, in 2016, as I said, Tim had a girlfriend named Colleen, and Colleen was pregnant. So Colleen ended up giving birth to Tim's baby later on in that year of 2008 in December. But from the years of 2008 to 2016, there was a very big custody battle between Tim's um, girlfriend and Tim's family because the family just saw Tim's girlfriend Colleen to be a very 
very unfit mother. So there was just a big custody battle between the two, but in 2016, that is when Tim's parents were able to get full custody for Tim's eight-year-old son. And the most recent thing that I could find was back in 2016, a lot of sources say that Vince is taking secondary training programs to help him get into the working field. So that happened in 2019. It's like three years later. I'm pretty sure Vince is now working and again he's going by the name Will Baker. So now Vince is not only out and about and seeing the world and living life and loving life but he's also in the working field now. He's he could be working with you who knows and that is the most terrifying part of it all that someone would do this like disgusting and sick and twisted of a crime and get very little time and even have the privilege to work among society again. I feel like he should have gotten way, way longer, even life possibly, for something as horrendous as that. I feel like if you do that sick of a crime, your soul is already lost. I feel like there's very little that you can do to try to bring yourself out of that. Some people are just just monsters. Some people, they get help and then once they get that help, they go out and do the same thing again and I feel like that is what Vince is going to do. You know, Vince, in the beginning, he had been diagnosed with schizophrenia but he went off of his meds voluntarily because he felt like he didn't need his meds. So, who's to say that we can still trust Vince that he's going to take his medication still? You know, there's no one around Vince as we're in a mental hospital. There's people watching you take your meds. Vince could easily go off his meds again and do the same exact thing. And who is to say that he won't do that, you know? And so that is the end of today's story. But before closing it off completely though, I do want to speak upon something that, you know, I feel like is very important. I feel like especially stories like this, I don't, like, I don't want you guys to leave here and get this twisted, but I feel like stories like this where people are diagnosed with schizophrenia and then the reasoning of their crime is because they hear voices, I feel like a lot of people assume that if you have schizophrenia, you are a murderer, which I just wanted to take a little bit of time at the end to talk about that because just because a person has schizophrenia or they are diagnosed with schizophrenia does not mean they have murderous tendencies. If you have murderous tendencies, there are people that murder every single day and don't have any mental illnesses at all or diagnosed with any mental illnesses. They don't have schizophrenia. They don't have depression. They are just, you know, killers. They are monsters. And so, especially with stories like this, it really does hurt me to research because I know that stories like this, it makes people who are diagnosed with schizophrenia, it makes them feel very shameful to come forward about it to other people or even speak about it because you hear stories like this and it makes them look like monsters when they're not monsters. They're just, you know, they have mental illness illnesses like everyone else and they're constantly working on it and again just because they have schizophrenia doesn't mean they're a terrible person you could still have schizophrenia and you know be an amazing you know lovable person and so I just wanted to touch on that really quick because I didn't want people to think that just because someone has schizophrenia it means that they're gonna kill you or they're hearing voices all the time I actually read one article where like most people people who are diagnosed with schizophrenia don't even really hear voices. It's more of like hallucinations, but that's just something I read one time. Don't quote me on that if it's wrong, but yeah, I just wanted to speak on that real quick because I don't want you guys leaving this video thinking, oh, people with schizophrenia are monsters. Like all of them hear voices. They kill people. No, it's not like that for everyone's situation. So that is all I need to say. If you guys found this video interesting, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you're, if you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening on Apple, Spotify, wherever you can find podcasts, make sure to rate it five stars and 
and yeah that is all from me i hope you guys have a beautiful wonderful rest of your day make sure to go outside get some sunlight if you're watching on the visual version you see that that is a little bit of sun that i am going to be soaking in today and i hope you do the same make sure to drink some water eat some good food and love yourself today okay anyways i'll see you next week bye Mwah.